All right, y'all, we're back with another Rotten Mango video. Today, we have a nasty one. This is going to be nasty. Um, so, I already, like, mentally prepared, but this is going to be very nasty. Uh, this, this video is called The Horrific Korean Boarding School That Abused Disabled Students. <laughs> Let's let's go. Come on, Stephanie. Have you ever wanted to watch more videos than the thousands of ones that are already on my channel? Hell yeah. How'd you do that? Huh? Tell me. You know, like the ones that I can't show on YouTube? Uh, I, I, I got you. I have a Patreon with three tiers. This is what you will get per tier. Both of you like to read it. Honestly, I love it. We be going crazy on the Patreon, but... I'm going to let you be the judge of that. So y'all go ahead and check out the Patreon and let me know what you think. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for supporting. And thank you for everything. Now, let's get back to the video. Let's go, Stephanie. Good God. Miss Stephanie, my bad. Bada bing, bada boo. Bada bing, bada In the middle of the night, a 13-year-old girl by the name of Lee, we're going to call her Lee, she would sneak out of her dorm room. Mm -hmm. She lived in this boarding school near the mountains in South Korea, like near the southern tip of South Korea. Kay. And it, it's not just a regular boarding school. The boarding school was strictly for students who had mental, physical, and or intellectual disabilities. Okay. They were always under close watch and supervision. So for her to sneak out at night, it was, it was terrifying. She could hear the crickets, the sound of owls. She could hear her feet pitter patter through the field. I'd sneak She's out too if I was at a boarding school. Outside school gates. She just needs to get past that and into the parked car. She opens like the passenger Harry side Tubman. and hops in. This time, there's two people in the car. Okay. Lee glances around to make sure that no teacher, no administrator saw her get in here. She'd be severely punished if she was caught sneaking out to talk to reporters. What? But worse things have happened in this boarding school. And she was ready to tell the journalists everything. So, Bro, they got students running out like Harriet Tubman to talk to reporters? That's insane. Like, real life sneaking out like, like they got dogs waiting on them or something. It's a known fact. Almost like clockwork in this school, especially on the weekends. Mm -hmm. The students would go to sleep petrified. Oh. They would wear as many layers as possible. Even in the scorching heat of South Korean summers, they would pull their blankets up straight up to their neck, sometimes even cover their heads. What? And they would wait. They can't fall asleep on the weekends. It's almost like you're waiting huh? for a boogeyman, a ghost to come in. What? If they're lucky, nothing happens the fuck you mean i can't go to sleep what oh no they wake up sleep deprived if they're unlucky they hear the door click open and someone is heard getting into the beds with the students oh no i have so many questions and we're only a minute and some change in Most of the times, all you heard were muffled pleas for help. Oh. He usually put a pillow over their heads. Everyone in the dorm rooms knows what's happening. What the fuck? They all know who it is. Jump this they nigga! They all know they can't dare say a single word. Instead, they all pretend to be asleep, praying that they're not next. Fuck that. But it wasn't just at night or just in the dorms. She told the journalist about how much the kids hated something called movie time. Movie Certain time? Certain teachers would turn on movies for the whole class and... The teacher would sit in the very, very back in the shadows, call over two to three female students to sit in the back with him, and he would assault them in front of a classroom full of students. How do you and have... Nobody ever tried to tell the parents or anyone what happened. Wh she said, well, he threatened to kill us. So it's just that one teacher, the one that plays the movies, or is he the, the same one that sneaks into the dorm rooms? No, there's more. There's one we call the pervert. When we see him walk down the hallway, we avoid eye contact. If the pervert catches you, it's too late. He caught Hemin. Hemin was a deaf student in the school. She was called into the pervert's office, and she didn't know why the pervert would want to see her. All she knew was that nothing good ever happens in the pervert's office. But she had no reason not to go. She literally lives here. No legitimate excuse that she can use. So she went. And when she walked into the office, she's facing away from the dorm. The pervert walks behind her and ever so slowly turns the doorknob and gently closes the door. And click, he locked it. 
But because Hemin was deaf, she didn't hear a thing. And she was turned, facing away from him, so she didn't see it. She had no idea that he was trapping her. And then, boom, he turned off the lights. It's pitch black. She could feel her breathing. There's a special place in hell for these motherfuckers, I swear to God. Hey, bro, I... I don't understand how people can be so evil, son. And why do these evil people get the opportunity to teach children and stuff like this? Like, what the fuck? Even going faster as her eyes are just trying to adjust to the dark. There is um, a tiny little TV in the corner that she hadn't really noticed before. But now that it's dark, it's the only source of light. So she's squinting. There was a disgusting adult film that was playing on there. What? And she whipped around and her determination was to just run out the door, right? Doesn't matter. Just run out. And there she saw him blocking the door. The principal standing, pants at his ankles, fully masturbating and staring straight at her. You know, I'm I'm going to be honest, bro. Like, I, don't, I feel like I got a sick imagination. And it's probably some wild shit to say. But, like. Uh, I ain't gonna say that. I'm not. I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say that. I, I'm not gonna say that. No. No. You know, I am gonna say that. I I kind of do wish that like I like went back in time as a kid and like. In this sick, twisted imagination, I wish I was a kid in all these situations or like being around these situations so I could do that thing to the person who's who's trying to get at these kids. Because like, what the fuck, bro? Like, think about it. Think about it. They wouldn't suspect a kid coming up behind them and castrating them, you know? I, I kind of wish, like, if I had the mind that I had now as an adult, I think my prefrontal cortex is developed, maybe. I don't know. I'm 24, so that's what that's what, that's what what Google said. I kind of wish I could go back in time as a child to get in these situations so I can kill these motherfuckers. Because why the fuck is you doing? Like, what? Why, bro? Why? Like, why? 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 Obviously, I know it's a it's it's a mental thing with these with these adults doing these shits to these kids, but like it comes to a point where you gotta get knocked off of this shit. You got you got you gotta die. You have to die. You need to die. And I don't want to wish death on nobody. I don't want to do that. But in this situation, I'm going against my morals and what I don't want to go. These motherfuckers need to get this. Mm 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 mm. Mm-mm, mm-mm. He's the principal. The pervert is the principal, and the nigga is the principal. Cause he would not escape his office unscathed. Wow. I don't know if the I can finish this. The student glanced out the car window and told them another story. A friend of hers had been lured into one of the teachers' offices. They ambushed her there, hogtied her, restrained her in five different places. She was gagged. A few of the teachers they assaulted her for almost fifteen hours. How? On the whole How? The, what the fuck? How? And then afterwards, as a lesson, quote, lesson, they left her tied up after the abuse. What the fuck? She knew that there was nobody she could tell that would help. I mean, we know that the police are working with the teachers. There would be no point. She had no choice but to go back to her dorm and try to pretend like none of this ever happened. But there were other rumors, too. When students would get pregnant. Oh, no. They would disappear. What? What do you mean they would disappear? We don't know. But one student was feeling morning sickness. She didn't have a period in like three months. She was pregnant. She started to show. One day we went to check up on her in her dorm room because she didn't make it to class. She wasn't feeling great. Her dorm was empty. She was gone. All of her belongings were gone. We never heard from her again. But that's not all. In the darkness of the car, the student told the journalist everything in a series of secret meetings, how they were starved. They would be forced to gather around for dinner and eat scraps of food that were left over from lunch, like teachers' food scraps. They were basically fighting for food in like a pit. Mm. There were rumors about a girl that had starved to death because she was so hungry. Are these she niggas wallpaper. Like, what the fuck are they doing in this school? Like, I, I, don't, I don't hear anything saying like they're learning or anything. 
At this point, fuck the learning. They need to burn this school down. Why are they letting this shit happen? And when she fell ill from eating wallpaper, because think of all the toxic substances in the glue and the paper she's eating itself, wallpaper. One of the teachers pushed her off the roof to make her family believe that it was no. her decision. Hey, bro, I'm going to be honest, bro. I really hope reincarnation is real. So if these people are still alive, cuz, if these people outlive me, I would I would probably ask God, can you please if I if I'm able if he does that, if that's like an option for reincarnation, I hope he can turn me into a superhero so I can knock these motherfuckers off. I don't think that's that's probably not the godlike thing to do. I'm sorry, my bad. But like like at the end of the day, like come on, bro. I'm about I'm just talking at the mouth right now. I'm gonna be honest. I'm a little bit tipsy, so that's why I have my water here. You know what I'm saying? It's 10 in the morning, but I had a tiny bit of wine. I wanted to feel nice. And then here's the thing. These are the terrifying stories from Inwa Boarding School for the Disabled. Uh-oh. It would inspire a movie called The Silenced. And this- oh, no. Not, not. Oh, God. No, oh, God. This movie resulted in a public uproar that would change South Korea as a nation. And I don't put that lightly. Like, South Korean law was forever changed because of this movie. Please tell me that it was changed because this movie exposed all this shit. Hey, yo, hey, did y'all know there's a movie? There's a... Hold on. I don't know if they're going to get me, but... Sorry, it's 11 minutes already. Y'all know there's a movie about some... Um, I don't know what it's... I don't remember what it's called, but there's a movie that's trying... They, that, that, that the people up top trying to get it taken down is about... It's about um, these parents bring these kids to an audition... And then the parents are not allowed in the audition. So when the parents come back, the kids is gone. It's a movie about that. I don't remember. Somebody in the comments might remember. But yeah, it is that. So let's get into it. Oh, my God. I'm sorry for too much pausing. My bad. We just started. Oh, this is going to make me mad because... As always, full show notes are available at RottenMinglePodcast.com. There is a fictionalized book on this case. Um, it, well, it's loosely fictionalized. So much of the abuse reported in the book is pretty play-by-play play of what the victims have stated have happened. Mm. The book is called The Crucible, written by Kong ji one of the most prominent, respected female book. writers in Korea. And it is what many South Koreans consider the most horrific read you can ever pick up. Ooh. And the thing about the novel is there was an investigator who worked on this case and said, yeah, the novel probably covered 25 to 30 percent of what really happened. Mm. But probably due to public well-being concerns and publishers legal you know, rights, I don't think that she could have ever published 100 percent of what happened. Ooh. There was the movie, the 2011 um, silenced movie that was inspired by the book. And it's often referred to the movie that changed South Korea. Because I think a lot of Koreans, they knew that it was a drama. They knew that it was sad. They knew it was going to be emotional. They went into theaters thinking, this is how I'm going to spend my Friday night. This is how I'm going to hang out for the weekend. People said when they came out, they couldn't breathe. It was like there was a 50-pound dumbbell on their chest. And I think maybe it's also... When you watch something in a big group of people, there's kind of this energy that feeds off of each other. People said this should be categorized as the worst horror movie ever. It's that bad. Oh, I don't know about that. Should I watch it? I don't know. I don't really like horror movies like that, but uh, I'm not watching it on stream or nothing. I'm just, this going to be a Patreon exclusive, but still like. Since this is a South Korean case, we had multiple Korean researchers assist in the gathering of the facts and a big warning. Today's story deals with a lot of children with disabilities, quite literally the most vulnerable population of society. Mm. It's not a happy story. It's Mm. pretty hard to get through, and it has an even more depressing end to it all. So if you're not in a good mood, if you're not in a good headspace today, I recommend turning this video off and maybe reading a book instead. I'm in a good mood So with that being said, Kim Ho-sung, he kind of had a creepy job. His job was to wake up at the crack of dawn, drive around in the foggy morning picking up students then he would drop them off at school being a being a bus driver isn't creepy and the kids aren't creepy but there was just something about that boarding school 
So it's a boarding school where most of the kids, they live there full time, but there were still a few that commuted. So he would pick up the commuters. Uh huh. The school was nestled at the bottom of a mountain. And it just looked, it looked like there was a perpetual cloud of fog looming over the place. And he would see the other students that lived at the school and just something about them, the way that they would walk around the school campus in the mornings when he came to pull up with the commuters, it's as if they were empty shells of ghosts. It's like he was pulling up to a zombie school. What? They weren't having fun. They weren't running around full of morning energy. They were zombies. Is this floating? What? There were probably moments he even joked with his family. Hey, maybe the school is haunted and those are all ghosts and I'm the only one that sees them. That's how the kids are acting. They're just crazy. Maybe uh, it's not even a boarding school. Maybe all the students that I bring, that's it. It's very creepy. The only reason he kept the job was the kids really liked him. Okay. Um, they really loved him. He was like a grandpa. They were so comfortable around him. He wanted to see their journey through, th- through the school years. Sometimes he would open the door. A kid would step in, smile, and wave. And as the sleeve of their shirt lifted up, he would see a bruise. Oh, fuck. Or multiple bruises. And the first time he saw it on a kid, he would lock eyes with the kid and smile. He wouldn't say anything because, you know, maybe kids are tough players. Maybe they got too excited at the playground. But the second time he saw it, he would try and approach it as gently as possible. What happened to your wrist? Hey, little nigga, you all right? He thought, maybe it's a parent, you know? But they would smile sheepishly and a friend would butt in. Oh, he forgot his homework, so the teacher punished him. Hwasung didn't like the sound of that. Okay, so what? teachers physically disciplining students in South Korea hadn't been outlawed at this point. But to leave actual bruises, that's going a bit too far, usually. You know what's funny? I got I used to get spankings as a child at school when I was at, like, when I was in um this Catholic school that I went to for, like, a year. I, I vividly remember me in the bathroom and my teacher pulling me out the stall and then taking me back to class and giving me some lashings. Not really lashings, but like she spanked me on my bum, like that's that's that uh, that's vivid actually. Rest in peace of that teacher though. I heard she died. He tried his best to be happy for the kids because it didn't seem like the teachers were that happy. It didn't seem like the boarding school kids were that happy. So and to, like the physical punishment also like it's not like. It's like usually they ask you to put your hands up and they will spank you with a ru- ruler. Yeah. So it's not like like punching you, leaving bruises. Not yeah. that kind of. Oh, physical. okay. Yeah, yeah it's usually like um, straight like liver shots. Spankings. This is back in the days. Yeah, spank yeah. your palm and type. Yeah, of or the back of your legs. It's not like they're just throwing you around, jumping you with a gang of teachers. My yeah. God. I mean, but there have been instances of that, and I think that's why it's been outlawed in South Korea. But yeah, it yeah. was supposed to be disciplinary action. So th- this is why he's very confused. The bus driver is like, that's not normal to have any bruises left on a student because he forgot his homework. That's abuse. That's not even disciplinary action, exactly. right? So he makes sure that he's the happiest part of the kids' days. The shy ones would get on the bus and he would try to bring them out of their shells like, okay, well, how was your day? What'd you guys do? He remembered as he was driving, he was having a conversation with one of the female students in the front row. And she was telling him about her day at school. Mm -hmm. Her tone was very relaxed, casual, and she said, for lunch, I had more Korean food, and then the teacher touched me down there because I forgot my homework, and then, oh, I think I had geography class right after. Hey, bro. You know what's crazy? You know they say, like, kids don't lie? I I don't fully believe that, because sometimes, because me as a kid, I used to lie. But when it comes to some shit like that, they're not lying. Like, they're not lying. I know kids' imaginations are crazy, but no, I don't know. I don't believe they would lie about some shit like that. Nigga, that would raise... What's worse than red? That would raise a black flag. Like, nigga, excuse me. What did you say, little girl? What? His hands gripped the steering wheel. And he glanced in the rearview mirror and the little girl is just smiling at him, telling him what happened as if, because she's a kid. How old are these students? I would have the nastiest panic attack. Why is she smiling? Because what, does she think that this is okay? Please tell me no. Nigga, I'm running this bus. When everybody get out of this bus, 
When all the kids are safe out of this bus, I'm running this shit into the principal's office right now. Fuck you mean. Like, so, okay, so this is- Are you crazy? High school, this boarding school, because mm-hmm. it's a school for the disabled. Um, There was not, it's not like really a high school. Yeah, yeah. So I think she was like 10. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Of course, she has no idea that this is wrong. Nobody taught her that, and that's not her fault, right? And she's just smiling, Ugh. telling this story because she's that young. He didn't want to push her too much. He was worried that he would cause her to close up or think that she was in trouble. So he tried to keep his tone light. Oh, a teacher touched you? W- where? In my pants, like near my potty parts. The little girl got distracted with her friends. I'm and that night, up. the bus driver went home, and he was pacing his living room. Sometimes you want to scream like, okay, well, bus driver, do something, right? But I had to nah. keep reminding myself that this is a completely different time from today. There yeah. was no social media. There was really no police that cared unless there was social media pressuring them to care. And the media didn't care unless they were guaranteed clicks. <laughs> Who was this bus driver to go up against an entire school accusing one of the teachers that he didn't even know which one of and I wonder, abuse? Yeah, and I'm sorry. No. And I wonder if it, this is also his livelihood. Yeah. And he had kids and a wife and he had... It's so many variables and I can understand why he probably did not think to do that at the time. The nigga had so many variables. It's not right. God damn, son. Fuck. So much pressure. This is really the only job he had. And I know people are going to be like, then get a new job, right? No, it's not that easy. It's It's not that easy. South Korea is very different from the U.S. So in the U.S., you could get fired from a job. And if your next boss calls your old boss and they start bad mouthing you, you could technically sue your old boss. The the employee protection oh, laws are a lot stronger here in South Korea. If you get fired from a job, you're effectively ba- blacklisted. Good God! It doesn't even matter if you were fired because you were d- too good at your job. Doesn't matter if you were. Oh, sorry, I was late dropping off the kids. I was trying to help this old lady that was having a seizure on the side of the road. It doesn't matter. You're blacklisted. So the bus driver knew that he's at the bottom of the totem pole. The wow. people doing this are probably at the top. A teacher, an administrator, he doesn't even know which one. If he stands up against them right now, he would get fired. And then what? And then they would replace him with a new bus driver? Who's to say the new bus driver isn't a predator? No. Oh. No. He had to stay where he was to at least try and protect the kids. But his job is done once he drops them off. Mm. He can't sit in class with them to protect them. He knew the smartest thing to do was to keep his mouth shut for the sake of his own kids. Fuck. But he just couldn't do it. Fuck. The next day, he went straight Bro. up to the head of administration, which is a.k.a. the vice principal, and he told him everything he heard from that little girl. And I don't know what the bus driver was expecting. Maybe nothing would get done, right? But at least he's expecting, okay, the vice principal is going to put on this show, and at least they would pretend to look shocked and like, oh, my God, outraged, and then promise him change, and they're going to do an internal investigation, Right. The vice principal looked at him and smirked. You're a bus driver, right? So just drive. And I punched that nigga in his fucking chin. You don't talk to me like that. I'm sorry. No. You don't talk to me. You're not going to talk to me like that. <laughs> You're not about to talk to me like that. I'm not going to lie. I don't give a fuck. And I'm going to be honest. I believe, I would kind of believe in myself that I do have self-control, but also I kind of believe in a different side of myself that will probably smack fire at that nigga right in that moment. Like, what do you mean fucking drive? I will drive this bus into your office. Nigga. Who the fuck are you talking about? Hey. If they saying I'm at the bottom of the totem pole then that totem pole must be very, very long because you ain't going to notice me smacking fire out this nigga and burning this... Never mind. <laughs> no good. Like, this is so weird. That's weird. That's weird. That's so weird. That's so fucked up, bro. What the Ooh. fuck? The implication being, keep silent and do your job and don't stick your head in what's not your business. The bus driver knew if, if this is how they're act- reacting to these accusations, he needed more to take down the abusers. So every day. Also, my American is speaking a lot. It's probably going to speak a lot through this video, just so y'all know. The bus driver became a spy. He had never signed up for this. He was just a bus driver. But here he was, 
the minute the kids were on the bus, he would smile and he would try to nicely, as untraumatically as possible, ask about any abuse that they encountered at the hands of teachers. When he dropped them off at school, he would look to the left and then to the right. And when the coast was clear, he would stay parked in his bus, pull out his black spiral notebook. He started furiously oh writing God. down every single detail he remembered. He didn't want to forget a single thing about what any of the kids said. And he would date it. He kept every single entry. He kept comprehensive records every single day for 20 years. He had stacks and stacks of black journals preserved in his home in his closet. And every time he and his family would walk past it, it would catch their eye. And it's just like, it's just like this dark energy that's just radiating off these journals. Yeah. Some of the journal entries talked about the art teacher. Oh. The art teacher would force female students up to the second classroom, second floor classrooms where it was empty. He would strip them naked so he could draw them. These are like 10-year-old girls. Why? Sometimes he did more than just draw. The story of Soyoung was also in his black journal. She was in the sixth grade when it happened to her. Remember how he talked to the vice principal? Soyoung was called into the vice principal's office after school because her grades were too low. And she watched all the other students gather their things, head back to the dorm rooms, and she made her way to the vice principal's office. She's thinking, okay, it's going to be miserable. Maybe like an hour or two of extra supervised study time. Or maybe he would just yell at her and call it a day. But when she stepped into the office, she stood in front of the desk with her head bowed. She watched as he walked behind her, closed the door, locked it, and he prances up behind her and starts groping her. And she remembered screaming, please, somebody help me. But he just whispered, shut your mouth and be quiet. He started hugging her until it escalated to a full incident of the R word. She was in the sixth grade. This was in the vice principal's office. She said it hurt so much she had tears streaming down her face. And after he was done, he tossed two $1 bills on the ground next to her. Soyoung didn't live in the dorm, so she walked all the way home. Is this nigga dead? Is he dead? He's dead, right? Home, and the two dollars could barely buy her a cup of noodles from the convenience store and it, i think it's not about the money i don't think any amount of money would have justified what happened to her or made it okay but it's it's almost a measly amount of money is worse more degrading than no money yeah. exactly the next like the thought that he thought this is gonna mean anything yeah to her yeah, yeah. and the thought that he thought that's enough yeah that's what she's worth is basically what he's insinuating. These are the your, next day, these she are, went to the Jesus principal students. and begged him to do something about the incident. And she's like, please, this is what happened with the vice principal. You're his boss. You're the principal. This is what he did to me. And the principal looked at her and said, you know, so young, you're almost to be about to be in the seventh grade, right? That's what becoming an adult is. You need to try and be the bigger person and show him some grace. Nigga, fuck you. Nigga, the bigger person done touched me. What do you mean? What, what do you mean be the bigger person? I'm a kid. I'm a kid. This is about to piss me off. Because these fucking adults be trying to play with these niggas like these kids are fucking stupid. These kids aren't stupid. They're naive. There's a difference. Nigga, why the fuck are you telling me to be the bigger person while your goddamn, while your subordinate, or whatever it is, your partner in crime, is touching on me? Fuck you, bro. Like, you not finna gaslight me like that, bro. Fuck is you talking about? Nigga, the principal need to, the principal need to get the shit beat out of him, too. Like, mmm, come on, son. Like, no, bro. No, bro. No. No. Talking about be the bigger person. Bitch, fuck you, me. No, nigga. Type shit my teacher used to say, be the bigger person. Nigga, the bigger person beat my ass. Nigga, not being a bigger person is shit. About to equalize this motherfucking situation. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Are you dumb? Are you dumb? You're probably dumb. Fucking teachers. I mean, fucking principals. And I come from a family of teachers. My my parents will never do no shit like that, bro. That shit made me mad as fuck, bro. 
Cause he's real life, bro. You're really like shaping a whole generation of 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 like your culture, and you're doing shit like this. The amount of power you have is insane, and you're doing shit like this. That's fucked up, son. That's fucked up, bro. Talk about you the bigger person, bitch. Fuck you, bitch. I'm not even gonna say suck my dick, you nasty motherfucker. You won't even get the fucking chance, bitch. Fuck you, mean. And just forgive him just this once. No. If he does it again, no. Then I can discipline him, okay? No. But how about if you tell me that I'm lying and saying he did it again? The fuck? Are you stupid? Do some shit to. Out, you learn to be an adult and learn some forgiveness. No, I'm gonna learn to be an adult and I'm gonna stab you, nigga. Learn to be an adult. What would you do if somebody was touching on you? You defend yourself, right? Adult? Huh? You know I'm saying? That coming from a, a, a culture that literally holds grudges sometimes or blames people. What do you mean forgiveness? Like, oh, I can't take this. Soyoung was our worded three or four. No, no disrespect. I'm, I'm sorry. Four more times during her time at Edema boarding school. The stories in these journals were terrifying, and the bus driver didn't stop trying. It's like he just sat there day in, day out, writing down the most horrific accounts of abuse and going home and doing nothing. He tried to bring it up at the company dinner. So they have hesheiks in Korea, which is basically you're forced to work after hours. You get invited by all your coworkers, your colleagues, your bosses, and you sit there drinking as much as your boss wants you to drink and kissing their butts. And then acting like you love it here. Okay, that's basically what it is. The bus driver is invited, and it's pretty well known that absolutely not in a million years, as long as you want to keep your job, you cannot say no. So he goes to the dinner. Everyone's getting drunk, you know, because the administrators, they keep pouring soju into everyone's cl- glasses. Now, another thing to add is I don't think the bus driver could just go to the police. If that's how he's being treated by his employers, think about how he must have been treated his whole life as a bus driver. Mm -hmm. He probably has no educational background. He probably doesn't feel like he has any social power. Mm -hmm. And in Korea back then, like the social hierarchy is even worse. So if you're at the bottom of the chain, like, you know, we know that Korea, you know, especially back then, they only take anything serious if it comes from an influential or wealthy family or person Mm -hmm. anyone below they can just disregard you completely for example let's say you worked for a massive corporation and you're like the executive of you're the vice president of that company you throw out allegations of sa they still won't take you seriously think about how a bus driver feels he's not a teacher he's not an executive he's not an administrator why would they take his word this is why would they believe him and a bunch of students that you know back in the day in korea it's always oh kids don't know what they're talking about Kids just say the darnest things. So he thought this was his chance. The bus driver never really got to interact with other teachers. All right. He's thinking, okay, the vice principal shut me down. The administrator shut me down. But maybe if I get a teacher with a college degree, an intellectual background, these teachers must be even more connected to the kids than me because they see the kids nonstop. I only see them when I drop them off, right? It's not like I can hang out in the break rooms. So he quietly spoke to a teacher in front of him while everybody else was drunk and rowdy. He's like whispering to this teacher about the things that he heard on the bus. And he's thinking, okay, the Heshik's about to go down. This teacher is probably going to finish listening to him and freak the fork out on the administrators. And it's going to be a whole thing. And then the teacher's like... He didn't realize the teacher he was talking to was one of the molesters. Instead of even trying to play off his crimes, it's like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, my God, I'm going to talk to the principal tomorrow. The teacher picked up one of those. So in Korea, we drink soup out of like earthenware bowls. They're made out of really heavy stone. It's basically a pot. You can put it on the stove. It's like a tulsot pibimbap bowl, right? Mm -hmm. I would imagine it's maybe... 50 times thicker than a regular bowl. He hit him with it. a piece of rock, right? You better not have hit him with it. Yeah. He picked it up, drank his soup, and hit the bus driver's head with the heavy bowl. Blood started dripping down his face and onto the table. They had to call an ambulance. It was that bad. And before he got on the ambulance, they basically told him, say a word and we'll kill you. Then fuck that, nigga. You're going to have to kill me. I'll do a a one on 17. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. 
I don't care. I don't care. Obviously, in the situation, I'll probably be scared shitless. But like, you're not about to. You're not about to. Hit, you're not about to hit me in front of everybody. I will fight. I will have you killed. Are you dumb? Are you dumb? What the fuck? I feel so bad, bro. God damn, this shit is not right that he could never speak out and at this point the faculty had verbally physically abused him for trying to protect the students so he focused on maybe one day he could be the voice of the students he wrote down every single story every event he logged it all the dedication and accuracy of his logs would be a great help to prosecutors later mm. but you can't help but wonder maybe things could have been different had just one teacher listened and maybe there was one Teacher J. We're going to call him Teacher J because the legal battle later gets so freaking messy. But if you've seen the movie, he's the main character. And his uh, story is based off real life events. I might, I might watch so that movie. So Teacher J started his teaching career in 2005, which, something to note, being a teacher in South Korea is a very impressive position. Not that it's not impressive anywhere else in the world. We freaking love teachers. But unlike here, teachers, teachers in South Korea, they actually get paid pretty well. You know, they have job stability. It's a really desired position. Once you get in, unless you get fired, it's really hard to just like move through the Like you just, once you get in, you have job security is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. But it's the getting in part that's a little bit difficult. Mr. J's dream job was actually a position that not a lot of other teachers wanted. Mm -hmm. He wanted to work in a school for the disabled. Okay, okay, okay. He understood it would t probably take more patience, more love, more compassion to work with disabled students. But he... He wanted that. Like, why not? He wanted to be a capable teacher that was worthy of teaching the, the vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. it, it should be a privilege. It felt like his calling in life, especially because he himself had a disability. He also knew sign language. So he would be using all of his skills to his advantage. Mm -hmm. wow. And so the first day at Inwa, he expected a really hectic day. I mean, think about it. You're working with kids. He's thinking, okay, I've worked with kids before. It's a handful. He's prepping himself for kids are going to be running around, screaming, being goofballs while he's trying to get them to settle down. Oh, man, after recess, they're going to have all that adrenaline from running. So then he's got to, you know, tone it down. He's going to be running around trying to understand all of his colleagues, which ones are nice, which ones are going to steal his lunch. He's expecting all of that. But when he walks into his first class, it was like walking into a funeral. What? These kids weren't acting like kids. They weren't even just well behaved. They kind of looked like they wanted to melt into the wall. Like they were trying to be invisible. What? None of them even wanted to be seen by him. Oh. It was weird. What the fuck? At first he thought, okay, well, maybe I'm new here. Maybe they need to learn that they can trust me, right? But then the surprises just kept coming. Mr. J was shocked to find out that in the school that was quite literally built for the deaf and mute, he was the only one in the faculty on his floor that knew sign language. What? Okay, you would think because it's a state-funded program, the government pays for this school, for boarding school with students with varying levels of oral and auditory capabilities, the bare minimum requirement for teachers would be that they know sign language so they can, I don't know, teach the kids, communicate with the kids. Another thing was Mr. J got to go home after classes. So most of the teachers, they didn't live at the school, but most of the students did. They never left, not even on weekends. And yet so much of the faculty didn't know sign language. Like what if, uh, what if a student had emergency? Why is the school in the middle uh, of the weekend? What? How could they communicate with people that don't know sign language? What the fuck do they be doing in, in these classes? Like what? And so many of them were sitting in the classrooms with bruises peeking out from under their shirts. Had this not been a boarding school, he might have assumed that the students were being abused at home. Mm. But they were here, in the school, all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe they're so calm because they play really rough at recess and they let out all their energy, right? He's trying to rationalize all these different explanations in his mind. And very quickly, there was just something that he couldn't ignore. A parent rushed into his class one day fuming. My son said one of the female students at this school is being molested by a teacher. Mr. J's eyes are bulging out of his head. Excuse me? I'm, I'm sorry, what did you just say? I asked my son if he was sure, and he said that he was positive. He speaks sign language, and I know that you are one of the teachers that do. So I need you to talk to him. I want that teacher punished. Mr. J brought in the parent's son, and the three sat down. And Mr. J asked, okay, tell me what happened. It's okay. Did your friend get... 
Did your friend get touched in places strangers shouldn't touch her? The student looked terrified, and his eyes were wide, and he slowly nodded yes. And then he rolled up his sleeves, and there was bruising all up and down his arms. He glanced around, because, you know, in South Korea, I don't know if you guys can picture the classrooms, but there's these giant windows. It's not like America, where it's like concrete walls and then a door with a window. There's like giant windows into the hallway. Mm-hmm. If you watch a K-drama of high school, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's making sure that there's no teacher walking by, no administrators, and he keeps his hands as close to his body as he can. And in the smallest motions possible, he's quickly signing. It's almost like he's hiding. Mm. I'm not the only one. Mr. J watched as this student, this literal child, was signing as fast as he could, just listing off the most horrific abuse that Mr. J had ever heard of. His eyes were watering, but he can't even look away. He had to listen to every single thing that this that student That music had to scared say. the shit out of me. And the student continued, I'm not the only one with the bruises. The teachers always beat us, and it doesn't matter what they do, they'll beat us. My friend wasn't the only one that was touched by teachers either. There's a lot more. The others. Why didn't you guys ask for help? Why didn't anyone say anything? Nigga, what? We tried. Every time we asked teachers for help, we just got sent away or punished even more. Uh. If any of us tried telling people outside the school, they would beat us or they would try and touch us. Mm. How did you find out that your friend was... She was walking weird and I asked her if she was sick. But she told me that she was R-worded. Mm. A man with glasses R-worded her and I was so surprised. Mr. J got up and went to grab the friend that this kid was referring to and let's call her Yujin. Yujin was only 10 years old and because both of her parents lived with mental disabilities her parents thought that the best thing that they could ever do for their kid was to send her to this boarding school. These are not parents that didn't want her. These are not parents that are like I'm so busy with work I don't want to spend the weekends with you. They genuinely thought if that if when they were growing up with their disabilities if there had been such a thing for students with disabilities they felt like they would have a chance at a normal life. So this was Yujin's chance. She would be surrounded by students like her. She would have a community, a place to fit in. And that makes this situation even more infuriating. To her, this, to her parents, this school was like a beacon of hope. And then they're just doing shit like this. And now she's shaking in her chair as this new teacher is signing to her. Did he? And she told him, yes, I'm sure that he did. He made me bend down and he pulled my pants down. And afterwards, he cleaned everything up with paper towels, and he gave me a cup of Coke to drink. The man with the glasses? Which one? And right at that time, she pointed at the perpetrator. It wasn't Mr. J's colleague. It wasn't a teacher. It was none other than the vice principal. One of the top dogs in the entire boarding school. And Mr. J could feel his chest moving up and down rapidly. Like, he had to be smart about this. He can't just confront the guy. If he is the vice principal, he has more authority than Teacher J. He could easily cover it up or shut him up. Teacher J stormed into the nurse's office, told her everything. Like, did you know about this? We need to get some evidence. Please tell me the nurse is not in these students If they're being abused like this. She boards here. Eugene lives here. So obviously she would have come here if she felt ill and she was very ill because she couldn't even walk properly to the point where her friends noticed. And Teacher J is like holding back his tears. This is a 10 year old we're talking about. A 10 year old with disabilities that was so excited to be at this school because for the first time in her life, she felt like there was hope. And he's on the verge of breaking down. And this is the terrifying part. The nurse's face is stone cold. I'll look into it. What? What? What do you mean you'll look into it? Bitch. I said I'll look into it, Teacher J. And that was that. Oh, no. Nah, she tone. No, 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 no. You one of them. You, 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 you one of them, bitch. The what dismissal? the fuck? I mean, honestly, it felt like the nurse was dismissing all concerns and probably knew what was going on. Ugh. Mr. J thought, fine, if she's not going to help me, I'm going to march down here with all the other teachers until she finally l- listens. When he told a few of the other teachers on his floor, they all avoided eye contact and they were glancing at the walls. I mean, how are you guys okay with this? Did you not hear me? Do I need to repeat myself? One of them sheepishly responded, yeah, but what can we do about it, right? Burn the school down. Mr. J feels like he's losing his freaking mind. Get all the kids out of there and burn this school to the ground. This is not a school. 
This is a jail. Some of these teachers don't even know ASL. What? Not ASL, my bad. Not American Sign Language. Some of these kids don't know sign language. I mean, some of these teachers don't know sign language. These teachers are not fit to be teachers. The vice principal is touching on children. The principal is doing the same thing. The nurse is talking. The nurse is complacent. Nigga, this place needs to go into a sinkhole. Put this shit at the bottom of the earth. What the fuck? Mind. Why is he the only one shocked at what's going on? Why does it feel like everyone is gaslighting him into believing that this happens at every school? It all goes back to the Inwa Mafia. That's what everyone calls it. So let There's a mafia? <laughs> let me give you the rundown on the Inwa boarding school. Even though this is a state government funded program, it was run like straight up like a mafia. That's what the press would later dub the administrators of this school, the Inwa Mafia. At the top of the food chain is the Inwa family. One family runs the entire school. Wow. The dad of the family is the chairman. The wife, the mom of the family, is the co-chairman. The first son is the principal. The second son is the vice principal. Oh the third God. son is the art teacher that likes to draw nude photos. Their niece is the director of student affairs. Their brother-in-law is this. Everyone at the top that's not a regular schmegular teacher was part of the family. That's why they feel like they can do whatever. And yeah. nobody can even say a thing. Not a thing. The family ran the school. There was no checks and balances because, sure, if the head of administration does something wrong, you can report it to the principal. But would you still report it if you knew they were brothers? Probably not. Okay, but what if the teachers got together to protest what's going on? Korea itself has a hierarchical society, has a hierarchy, in, like just embedded into society. And it's very different from the U.S. where technically you have a hierarchy. You're like, okay, there's a manager, there's an assistant manager, there's the employee. It's nearly impossible to speak out against your boss. Mm. So what happens is a lot of Korean companies don't like to hire people that disrupt business. Makes sense. Even if you're doing the right thing, if it's disrupting business, you're not a good employee. Mm -hmm. Bringing up allegations of abuse has often been considered making waves, which is crazy. Okay, I'm not saying this is proper or right. I'm giving you context. This is crazy. Okay, Ugh. it's considered making waves. And if you get fired, you'd be blacklisted from the industry. Your next employer won't care that you are sticking up for vulnerable students who are being abused. They will see you as someone who causes problems. And remember how I said teaching is a pretty prestigious career in Korea? Because of that, a lot of people want to become a teacher, which means there's not enough open positions. A lot of teachers at Inwa ended up there because they had, they had no other option. And the family knew that. Mm -hmm. They exploited that. They would often force teachers to pay for their spot. This is so legal. Especially if you, essentially, if you don't want me to fire you and replace you with someone else next semester, give me 10% of your paycheck back. This 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 family this family is fuck this family is fuck. Hey, I'm gonna be honest, gang. If you are a descendant of this family, I hope that you are not like this family. I hope that you probably. I I actually I don't know. I would say God bless you, my nigga, because imagine you come from a family like this. Like, dude, this is. This family is cursed. The teachers were so terrified of the Inwa family, they would bring them gifts every week. This is so bizarre. But every week, they were expected to bring the family gifts. And if they didn't, their names would be written on the whiteboard in the office room. Kind of like, hey, we know you didn't gift us anything this week. And also, we're going to publicly shame you. Even during oh, oh, you're going to get a nice gift. It's going to be a, a big fat turd on your desk, nigga. I'm going to shit on your desk. That's what I'm going to do. There's your gift. You ain't say what type of gift you wanted. You got doo-doo on your desk. That's the type of gift. The fuck have y'all got going on here? Which is like Thanksgiving. So typically Koreans might bow to the floor to show respect. This is the ultimate bow. So you know how Koreans eat and they say hello and they go, yeah, say all right. The ultimate bow that I've only done a few I times in my life. I myself doing that, actually. Um, primarily to family, like my aunts, uncles, my parents. You get on your knees, your hands touch the ground, and your forehead touches the floor. 
this is the ultimate sign of gratitude respect like you do this for people who have given their lives to raise you you do this maybe for if you're religious right for people that have genuinely saved you made you who you are you don't do this for an employer Mm. the teachers were expected to bow to the family during special holidays okay i get it there's a hierarchy in korea but this is bizarre like if you told any korean that they'd be like are you out of your mind like have you lost your marbles what are you talking about (laughs) most of the teachers at inwa they had their own families they had their own loved ones with medical bills they had their own futures to look out for most of them i will give it to most of the teachers had no idea what was going on remember a good portion of them don't speak sign language the teachers don't live on campus they go home at the end of the day Uh the ones that lived on campus with the kids they were mainly part of the administration Side note, the family does have their own home, the Inwa family, but I think they took turns and they would have a few different teachers that would stay during the weekends and the nights, but just keep that in mind. But for the teachers that did know and did nothing, I have no words. And so much of the abuse seemed like it was on a scheduled basis, especially on the weekends when most of the teachers would gone, the vice principal would come into the dorm rooms. He would play music really loudly on speakers and assault the students. That's some insane shit. Like, imagine being that cracked in your brain that you have scheduled scheduled assaults. Like, you have a, f- a calendar. Like, you're going to go to this room. You're going to go to this room. Oh, we're doing this. It's like clockwork. Like, nigga, how? Like, how? How? Why? Why is a whole family, like, complacent in this? It doesn't make sense to me. One victim said... He forcefully kissed me, so I got angry, and I kicked him, and I told him to get off, so he he slapped me. And it wasn't just him. It seemed like everyone was in on it. The principal, the older brother, he was in on it. He was actually called the pervert by the students. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His favorite thing was to make us watch adult films with him. Again, I can't, I don't know if every single family member, a part of the Inwa family participated in the abuse or if it was just the sons, but I can't imagine that the parents don't know. I can't imagine that the co-chairman and the wife didn't know. know. I feel like they knew. There's no way. Even the nurses were in on it. Exactly. So there was another nurse at the school who helped forge. Anybody who's able to do some crazy shit like that, you have to have, you have to be so, you have to have the ultimate audacity that you're probably going to tell your mom and dad that you're on this type of timing. Probably not, but probably so. Somebody's going to tell them up top. Somebody is going to tell, because no. There's no way you're getting away with this so many times and nobody's telling your higher-ups. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But anything is possible, I guess. Medical records of the students when the administrators, the predators, needed it. This is wild. So... (laughs) A predator assaulted a student and then dragged her to get a nurse checkup to prove that she had no recent sexual activity. Like, what an odd thing to do, right? It's even more suspicious than not doing anything at all. But he dragged her there and demanded a physical checkup on her private parts. And I don't know what kind of school nurse does these types of checkups, but the parents were not alerted. They did not give parental approval. The nurse did the, quote, exam and stated that there was a tear in the hymen. Now, side note, that's not really proof that she was R-worded because hymens can tear or break from even riding a bike. Mm -hmm. But the nurse initially wrote in a report that there was a tear. Now, that doesn't prove if she did or didn't have sexual encounters. That's what the nurse wrote. And then mysteriously, the document was updated by the nurse. The administrators clearly didn't like this. The did or didn't lingo, it's too confusing. Did it or did it not happen? The nurse changed it to read. In my professional opinion, I'm 100% certain that no sexual act was committed. Technically, you can't tell as a medical professional. So we could bring in the argument that the the nurse was bribed. or. Is there any cum? Where's the semen? There's no DNA? None of that? Or is that like not a nurse's jurisdiction? Like you have to actually get like a scientist or something? Threatened into adding that, but my personal excuse my ignorance. I'm sorry. Is that he full well knew what he was doing? A teacher brings in a young student in for a vaginal examination, and the parents and guardians are not present, and the teacher is un uh, allegedly unhappy with the inconclusiveness of the exam. It's very cut and dry. You don't know. It's very cut and dry. It's really not hard to put the pieces together. Yeah, like what? Another thing that makes this. Plus, you're a teacher. Use your fucking context clues that you teach, dickhead. What? 
that's extra horrendous is remember how it's a state funded school it's funded by the government they get paid for the number of students who attend the more students there the more money the family makes more students to abuse and more money not only were the inwa family abusers just disgusting they were really greedy technically the school is a charity and they constantly accepted donations from the public people wanted to donate clothes art supplies books whatever it may be and what the school does reminds me of you know those really shady charity stories that come out once in a while mm -hmm. about corrupt charities where you have all the charity organizers pocketing the money and just marketing to you basically like they Black show Lives you a Matter. picture of this new state of the art oh, god sorry sorry that still kills me. That still kills me. That's that still kills me. That shit really kills me. They really played in our faces with that shit, from what I know. But maybe not. I don't know. People's fucked up. Facility for sheltered dogs, and then you realize it's fake. That ninety percent of the dogs that they rescue are kept in horrendous conditions that you will never see. This is like a set for ads. They say mm. it's like that at Inua. The teachers would take all the donated shirts, do photo shoots with the students, rip it off of them, and sell these used shirts for cash. Like they would make pennies on the dollar. They weren't even selling wow. it for much. It's not like people are donating Dior shirts. People are donating just worn out shirts. That that's how greedy they were. Every Mr. Krabs penny, ass niggas. They refused to give it to the people that they're making money from. Uh. Like, it couldn't even be a shirt. They would even sell art supplies. Used school supplies, like three ring binders, they would sell it instead of give it to the students. So the family would do anything to prote protect their status and their positions. Mr. J was going up against what felt like a mountain as tall as Mount Everest. But he was willing to do anything to protect these kids. Shout out to Mr. J. Man. He didn't care if nobody stood behind him, if the nurses and the other teachers wouldn't listen. The next step was the police. So he went to the local police station after work one day. Hey, shout out to Mr. J, man. People like you deserve so much more than you've gotten. Shout out to Mr. J, man. And the police listened intently as he's telling a story of what he had heard. They listened, but it didn't seem like they were taking any notes. And he questioned, why aren't you guys writing this all down? When he was done, the police doubted if the students could even communicate clearly what did or didn't happen to them. How do you know it's not just miscommunication? What are you saying? Just because some of the students are deaf or mute? Are you serious right now? The police did contact the victim's parents and they asked the victim's parents to get all the evidence, to go gather all the evidence of the abuse so that they can maybe feel inspired to do their damn jobs. When the parents would try and argue the police should be doing that, how are they going to walk in and look for evidence in a school? The police would casually just state, well, then I think this is a case for the child services department and not us. You should take your complaints there. CSD would send them back to the police. Everyone kept bouncing the yeah, case around what the because fuck? it Yeah, I was about to say, what? We just went to the source that they, they're they going to send us to. What the hell else you think child service is going to send us to when it's time to go up to the high risk of child services? You, nigga, we're going to you. Like, what? It wasn't their jurisdiction. It just reminds me so much of this Hiller Ferry case. Oh, okay. Nobody wanted to do their job. Nobody wanted to be accountable for anything. The police were assholes, and they were super ableist. Mm. This particular police station avoided dealing with sexual crimes against people with disabilities. Not even just minors. Everyone with disabilities. These Why? officers felt like people with disabilities were untrustworthy. Wow. Huh? They said they always change their stories. They stated if they have a mental disability, how can they remember correctly? Their job is to protect and serve the population. And here they are essentially allowing crimes against. You think people with disabilities can't remember? Nigga. Non-disabled victims change their stories. I don't. My head is about to start hurting. One of the most vulnerable groups of people. These officers are just as bad as the predators. Hell yeah. So the teachers wouldn't listen. The school wouldn't listen. The police wouldn't listen. And Mr. J had one option left. And it was going to ruin his career and almost potentially ruin his entire life. He went to the media. 
Oh, shit. He called the local news, the media outlets. He said he had insider information on one of the biggest child sexual assault scandals inside of a school for disabled students. Oh. He worked closely with the network NBC, and together they were able to gather nine victims that were willing to speak up about what happened to them. Oh, shit. I believe a few of them had graduated, but most of them were current students, and I can't emphasize enough how brave these students are. Keep in mind, oh a God. lot of these kids live full-time on campus. They all have some degree of a hearing, speaking, or mental impairment. And a good majority of the kids had the mental functioning level of a toddler. Mm. The teachers knew that. They used it to their advantage. These kids were in the complete control of the authority figures, and they were well aware of this. They were well aware that they had no power. It was them up against an entire school of wealthy, elite people with social power and connections and all the tools available to communicate what they believed happened. And they still agreed to put their lives on the line, essentially. Mm. Many of the perpetrators were out in the open once the documentary aired. So NBC aired this whole documentary about all the crimes inside the Inma school. Now, I will say that this documentary wasn't that explosive. People who cared, cared. People who didn't care, didn't care. It's not like the movie. I think if this documentary came out today, it would be a whole thing. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, people were just like, well, we don't really know, and it's not really our business, and I'm not even from that part Put of town. Put it in a movie. No. Put it in a movie. And uh, can we really go on a crusade? How would we even organize something like that? Feature film. Many of the perpetrators, their names were out in the open in the documentary for the world to see. Bam. And the crazy thing is they had no shame. What? The vice principal, one of the more heinous abusers inside that entire administration, opened the door to his home for documentary makers and let them into the house. He was wearing nothing but his underwear. He sat down on his living room floor as if these are just family friends coming over to play poker. He's wearing underwear only? Yeah. So, like, they came over when he wasn't working and he's like, yeah, yeah, come in. He doesn't even go and get changed. He doesn't even, like, tell the intercom, hold on, I gotta go put on some clothes. And he knows what they're here for. These journalists aren't lying. They're not like, hey, we're here to deliver a chair. They're like, we are the NBC producers. We want to talk to you about this case. And you mean to tell me he ain't tell his parents and like everybody else that, but that what the hell he doing? You mean to tell me that? Okay. So it's not only that he doesn't, he doesn't even care. He no. doesn't even think this is going to affect how he looks. No. So he doesn't even try to look serious or anything. Yeah. He doesn't try to act shocked, serious, or hurt. He just lets them in and says, just by listening to the kids' so-called stories, like, how can you guys take this seriously? How can you come over here and give us all a freaking headache over some hearsay? So he's saying that the story is false and that the victims are liars? Mm. Not exactly. He continues, well, the nurses did it too. The teachers were constantly abusing the kids. Oh, my God. That There's this what? one teacher. I forget his name. He stopped working there. Kwong something, okay? He did it. You should ask him. I mean, even if the parents filed a complaint, nothing happened. So what, what do you want us to do? The kids have nowhere else to go. We're the ones taking them in. What the fuck? I, don't, I know. Huh? You look so confused. I was so confused. And I was like, oh, maybe this is like a translation mistake because I don't understand the thought process. But he's basically saying in a whiny tone as if the kids have nowhere else to go and being stuck there to be abused somehow makes it better. Like it's almost like a you're welcome. We're even taking them in. So what? It's not perfect. At least we're taking them in. No one else wants to take them in. I truly really don't know what's going on with his now brain if I chemistry. detonate this bomb strapped to my chest, right. you'd, be, you'd be crazy, Another right? incident really stood out to me. Um, the vice principal, again, later was interviewed by NBC, and he bluntly, audaciously told them, I already filed all the claims. I'm sorry, excuse me, what claims? For false allegations? It's not even an arguable story, really, but they made it all up. I was so shocked when the students lied. I mean, how could they do that to me? How could they do that to me? When I talked to the students, I was always encouraging. I always had good intentions. They were always starved for love. If my sin is being too nice and too kind, then fine. That's my sin. This is all so ridiculous. So now you're saying you never committed any crimes? Yep, never did. Swear to God. Side note, at this point, the principal's wife, so the vice principal's sister-in-law, comes out and is like, Oh my God, you guys again? What's wrong with you guys? The case is over. He resigned. So the vice principal had resigned after the documentary. He resigned, okay? Get over it. No, he's going to die. He needs to die. Wow. He needs to die. What? And the vice principal pulled out a letter and said, see, I told you guys I wasn't lying. 
He pulled out a paper and held it for the producers like a proud little rat. Like, I don't know how else to describe him. I'm sorry. But he's like showing it off, this piece of paper. And it reads, Yujin, one of the victims, did not have sex with the head of administration. That's literally what it reads. And she signed it along with six other signatures of students that were witnesses and guarantors. Ignoring the fact that minor signatures are not legally binding, this is so messed up for so many reasons. Can you imagine the amount of fear that Eugene went through when he R-worded her and now the R-worder is pressuring her into signing this document and the fact that she still had to see him, she still had to talk to him. She was 11, but he claimed he didn't pressure her at all. He said, no, 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 I just very nicely asked her why she said the things that she said and she admitted to me that Mr. J forced her to lie. Hey, this whole family needs to get out of here. I'm not going to hold you, girl. No. Forced start to lie. You know, these are like the worst people. These kids need more love and attention, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They don't even treat them as equals. They already have a viewpoint of these kids. And mm -hmm. then they took advantage of it mm -hmm. and started a school. Just yep. so they can take make advantage, money. yeah, make money mm -hmm. off them. So I don't think they started this for the right reason. They started yeah. this for this evil reason. Oh yeah, to make money off to the take government. advantage of them. Yeah. yeah, and then they're like, oh, well, we're also predators, yeah. so this is great. Yeah, and they're saying, no, we are at least doing the good thing, guys. I mean, it's obvious that they are just monsters in all of this and the fact that they made a bunch of kids sign a document and I think it's also the audacity that he's holding up this piece of paper like I told you so. What are you talking about? Like no one in the court of law is going to go say, oh my God, that victim that's so scared of you. I guess that is a pretty legal piece of document. He says, I even have a video recording of her admitting that it was all lies. Nigga, what? Thankfully, producers went to find someone else that was at that quote meeting and they're all a bunch of kids. One of Eugene's friends said that the room, there was so much pressure. They kept telling Eugene, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. And they suddenly got angry and started to hit Eugene. What? She told them the truth and they said, no, that's not what we want you to say. They wanted her to deny that the R word ever happened. They said that they will be so nice to her if she said so. <sighs> I thought something was wrong because if they don't have any sins, why would they need to hit us? Exactly. So even after that, the student doesn't really understand what was happening. They know it's wrong. They know that the administrators bullying Eugene is wrong, but they don't really, they can't, they're too young to grasp the concept of why they're even doing that. So it's not a moment of these students being like, see, they're trying to get us to change our story because they're in trouble. It's a moment for students being like, wait, no, but this is the truth. So now it's so weird and confusing and we don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. It was later revealed that the administrators convinced older students to literally waterboard victims and witnesses if they were talking to the press. What the fuck? Now y'all doing... Now y'all doing terrorist torture stuff? What the fuck is... Literally waterboard. Take them to the laundry room and waterboard them. Thankfully, even if Eugene had to formally recant her statement later in the trial, because of this coerced letter, it was just too iffy to use her as a testimony. There were students that witnessed her assault through the office window. <sighs> They even saw the wiping with the tissues, the coke, the cup of coke part. They stated clearly for producers that Eugene was screaming, no, no, no. And that part is going to become devastating. What do you mean? The fact that she was screaming, no, just keep this in mind. Hmm? So obviously, when the coercion didn't work, the vice principal asked to meet with Mr. J in a hotel lobby and begged him to negotiate with the administration. If Mr. J was to just admit that he made all the kids lie, he could get all the benefits that he would ever dream of. He could be the next vice principal for crying out loud if he wanted. The vice principal said, I'm the chairman's son. Yeah, cause Being on my good side, it would be really good for you. Boy, fuck you. Mr. J rejected it. Fuck and the head of family. administration... You know, he's married. The vice principal is married. He's doing all of this with the wife and kids. And what's crazier is that the wife is sticking by his side. His wife comes out and begs, pleads with Mr. J. And she says, my husband is not responsible for any of this. He did not do it. He could go to prison for a really long time because of this. Please, you have to help us. Mr. J declined. Mm. And he went to the media and told them what happened. The school was super pissed with all the negative press that they were getting. They didn't even care about doing damage control. They just felt rage. So they fired Mr. J on the spot. 
Okay. I mean. They responded to journalists. Deaf people always lie. <sighs> wow. Deaf people always lie. It's in their nature. They lie as much as they eat. I was so shocked at this line. Okay. They lie as much as they eat. It's such a... I don't know if it comes off in the translation, but in Korean, it's such a disgusting way to describe something. Mm. It's like you don't even see them as humans. You see them as like animals. Oof. They said, teachers who I know also said the same thing as me. Deaf people always act however they want for their own comfort. They only think about the present moment. That's why they lie, and that's why we should never trust them. That's usually a firm iron rule in this industry. I have a d deaf family member, and he does not come off nothing like that. He's such a he's such a great person. Shout out, Unc, bro. Like, what? Fuck. What? Why would you say that? Can you imagine? This is like the... Why would you say the that? Care, um... What are they the called? Caretaker. Caretaker of these. Like, can you imagine? Why would you say that? <sighs> what the fuck? What? Yeah. What I don't understand is, yeah, I don't know. Like, but how do they think it's okay to say that too? That's yeah, what like what? And I think, like, okay, I think they are evil. They are monsters, and they did receive a lot of backlash. But whatever the community, whatever bubble they're in made them feel that was appropriate. So it's not just the person yeah. saying it that's wrong. There must be people behind this family that are like, yeah, I totally agree with you. They must have family friends that they go out to eat dinner with and complain about the students that literally are their livelihood. And everyone must say, yeah, you're totally right. I just can't imagine what that community of their friends mm -hmm. or those closest to them are like if they think that this is okay to say in public to yeah. producers. They're probably making fun of them all the time. Yes. And jokes around and so like i said we're probably covering a small percentage of the abuse that truly happened the school was open for over 50 years it's 50 years of abuse we're talking about and i'm sure it's just horrific to the point where i don't think any of the general population knows truly the full extent of what happened he said that with his full chest and i have no words I don't think people could be even more enraged. Parents of the school and the victim staged a sit-in. They demanded something to happen. Please. It just, I mean, the police hadn't gotten involved. Mr. J was fired. The perpetrators are still working with children and getting paid by the government. The people who saw the documentary, they were mad, but it wasn't enough. It was still up to the parents to fight. They just wanted the school to shut down. They spent eight months, eight months of their lives on pause, living in front of the school on the street. Mm. They set up tents. They held signs that read, life is hard enough with a disability. How dare you? Harsh punishments for sexual predators. In a gut-wrenching moment, the parents would protest in a full bow, on their knees, forehead touching the hot cement, scraping their hands, palms, knees, everything on the cement. Mm. This position is really hard to keep, they're doing this nonstop, begging the public to help them. For hours in the heat, this is what they did. Sometimes students joined them, and they would wait outside the school gates with cartons of eggs and cake. When the Inua family would walk through the gates, they would egg them and then throw flour on them. Mm -hmm. You've most likely seen this in K-dramas. It's a real practice. It's Boo. one of the more severe social shame bullying tactics. And normally I'm against it, but I can't say that I'm mad on this case. And this is when media turned. Huh? Really random articles started coming out about how ungrateful students at this school were. The article... Boy, you, I'm about to turn this video off. You got me... F nah, nah, bro. ...were basically fluff pieces for the Inwa family, probably on their payroll. They would write things like, I mean, I get it. The students are upset. But this is still a working principle at the end of the day. We need to respect our teachers and elders. What are we teaching society? And they would say... What are we teaching society? All right, let's write it down. Okay. What are we teaching society? Um, just because the te there's, there's a teacher, that means they can they can molest children. That's what we're teaching with this with this right here. If that's what you want to do, um, everybody's in on it. Everybody, checks and balances, no carte blanches, oof, through the roof. Nepotism, oof, through the roof. Okay, what what else we doing? Um, apparently, apparently, according to them, deaf people lie as much as they eat. That's what we're teaching society to, you know what I'm saying? That's what we're teaching them. Um, what else are we teaching society? Oh, when you, uh, essay a little girl, it's okay to give them a cup of Coca-Cola. 
for two dollars. That's what you teach the society. Fucking fuck everybody a part of this shit that's like not on the right side, fool. Like things like no. this is a school that took them in when nobody else did. Don't give a fuck. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if nobody took them in. You took them in and fuck them. Like what? Huh? Fuck you. Why are you so high and mighty, nigga? Okay. Wow. I really hate wow. that sentiment. I really hate that sentiment. What does that even mean? No, they were getting rich off this school. They were getting rich off this school. I'm sure if given the chance, there are so many people who genuinely want to help these students that don't have the proper connections or maybe they don't even have the proper education and that's why they can't. Hmm. And because the school was still operating, the principal gathered up all the students that egged him and forced them to write apology letters. This guy wants apology letters for getting egged. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were the driest apology letters that I have ever written read in the history of my life which like good for them right mm -hmm. but they would write things like i'm sorry to the principal for making him uncomfortable dear principal we're sorry that we threw red paint at you we're sorry that we egged you from now on we'll do the right things mm -hmm. the principal was pissed he started <laughs> to physically abuse them again oh. he would line up the students and slap them around and scream because your parents are out there protesting and doing that weird shit now you're getting hit in here just know that this is because of your parents no way they're still inside yes they have nowhere else to go. Finally, the protests gathered enough public interest and got enough civilians riled up that the police were pressured into launching an investigation. After a few months, Korean law enforcement arrested six Inwa school administrators and teachers. They were going to court. Nine victims were going to testify. To the gallows. The National Human Rights Center sent representatives to help prepare the victims and go through their trauma. Now... Trial number one, there were a lot of rough details that came out during all of this. Just really rough allegations of abuse. You know, the, I'm talking watching adult films, forcing them to kiss and just really nasty, nasty stuff. I mean, most of which we've already covered. All of it is like coming out into the open during the trial in its full gruesome details. Another student, let's call her Sumin. She was one of the girls that would get invited over to the teacher's homes. This is very sick and twisted. So think about how vile the psychology behind these monsters are. The vice principal would want to abuse his student. He does it in the school, but it's not enough. He wants to now bring that student into his home that he shares with his wife and kids. He forces that student to eat dinner with his whole family while he tells his wife about how good of a student Sumin is. After dinner, the teacher, the vice principal, suggests that his wife and kids go run some quick errands while he and Sumin go over some practice tests. He then assaults the student in his own home. I feel like there's some sick psychology behind that. Yeah. Like the risk it would take to even bring the students home and the whole dinner. Like, it's so sick and twisted to me. Like, what are you getting out of it? it it's like something is wrong with you. Yeah. Because he's getting something out of it. Mm-hmm. And it didn't just happen once. It happened multiple times to Sumin alone. And I can't imagine that she was the only one that this vice principal did this to. If the girl refused to go to his house, he would beat her and R-word her in the school for retaliation. So there was no winning. Speaking of retaliation, those who ever looked like they would think about talking about the abuse, they were beaten to a pulp. The physical abuse in this school alone would have warranted a trial. There is some photo evidence of it. I'm not going to show it because these, again, are... Um, a lot, a lot of it would happen on the bottoms, like the butt, right, of, and they're minor, so I'm not going to show that. But Thank you, Stephanie. There's a, um, appreciate it's just, that. there's no part that looks like skin anymore. It's just blue, deep purple, like yellow, but not oh. in like the yellow undertone, like the bruising yellow. Mm -hmm. It looks like it was done with some sort of long cane. So many of the parents of the victims actually knew about all of this, but they themselves struggled with mental or physical disabilities, and they knew that the police would never believe them because they weren't able-bodied. Mm. So they felt like their best way to protect their child was to help them feel better and would teach them how not to cause trouble. And what's so sad is, and I think like, 
these parents are always teaching these kids how not to be a burden to able-bodied people. And that kind of mindset is so heartbreaking because it is what the like fuck? that's not how we should think at all. One victim's grandmother cried out, how can intellectual people do this? How do they even dare do something like this? The perpetrators were intellectual people. My granddaughter is deaf and she cannot speak a word. How can he do that to her? Do they feel no pity towards her? If there were no laws, I would find the perpetrator and tear them apart with my own two hands. She is a kid who cannot even speak. Do you remember Soyoung at the beginning of this story? She was assaulted and then given $2, $2. She would tell the principal what happened and he ignored her, right? She ended up graduating and tried to move on with her life. She got married, had a child. Oh. And she said every day all she thought about was the abuse. Even with her husband, she said it wasn't until the trial that she told him what actually happened. She was so worried that he would feel ashamed of her. She thought that he'd be upset with her. And she was so scared. And thankfully, he was a normal, morally upstanding person. He held her hand. He listened to her. And when she was done, his face was soaking wet with tears. And he told her, none of this is your fault. He told reporters, I was so angry after what I heard. I wanted to wipe out all the teachers. I just want to see them one time face to face. During the trial, the defense did some insane things. Their line of questioning towards Hoyong and another one who also was a victim, grew up, got married, and had a child. The lawyers asked... These are the perpetrator's defense attorneys. They asked, how can you get married and pregnant if you had ever been R-worded? I'm sorry, what? I love y'all, so I'm going to finish the video. But I am, I am, I am, I am so close to turning this shit off. Their logic in this was, if a person who is R-worded, they can never fall in love and get pregnant due to the trauma. They believed if someone is truly traumatized sexually, they can never heal from it. And there's no way that they could ever be intimate ever again. How about you try try do, try your own hypothesis and see what the fuck happens? How about, how about you do that? Go ahead, try your own hy hypothesis and see how fucking stupid you are. What? Therefore, if the victims got pregnant, there was no way that they were ever R-worded as kids. Another really infuriating detail to note is... Bro, if that shit happens to... Bro, I'm not trying to wish no shit on nobody, bro. But, like, Slim, if that shit happened to one of your family members, you fuck around and find out that your mom who was pregnant with you was going through some shit like that. And you got the audacity to say that shit on trial? Man... Is it's going to be important throughout the trial. Most of the students in the school were using sign language to communicate. And to put it nicely, their sign language education and vocabulary was questionable at best, detrimental at worst. Oof. Many of the teachers in the school didn't even know sign language. How do you expect the students to learn? I mean, regardless of the case or not, that is so devastating that they aren't even taught the ways to express their emotions and feelings like most people can. It's such a disservice. The students had a limited range of expression, including words to describe the exact series of events. And just, they were too young to even understand what really happened to them. They were, they just kept signing that they felt icky. Mm. They felt icky. Other students said it was so sad because these kids, they would go up on the stand and they would start getting so frustrated with themselves that they can't express mm -hmm. what happened to them mm -hmm. because they weren't given the tools. <sighs> and again, I just want to disclaim that sign language is a complete language. And the reason that they couldn't express it was not because sign language didn't have the words, but they weren't taught that. Even if there were all the ways in the world for the kids to accurately express themselves, they weren't taught any of it. Spectators said... The worst part was they ended up having to act out a lot of what happened because they just couldn't sign it. Hmm? Yeah. 
There were also issues with the initial trial where the interpreters that the prosecutors got. So this is on the government's end. I don't know why they did this. The interpreters barely knew sign language. So people who knew sign language that were spectating the trial, they're like, what is going on? So the prosecutors were a- would ask, why would the teacher do this? The interpreter would say, why would the teacher do this? The student would respond. And then the prosecutor would ask, okay, what did he do? But then this, the interpreter would just say, why did he do this? So the kid is like, why are you, they look confused. Like, why are you, you just ask this. whole this. thing I'm is so fucked. Confused. And because they're so young and vulnerable, they felt like, oh, maybe they're going to keep asking me until they like my answer. Oh, God. So sometimes they would keep changing their answer because it's like, why yeah. else would they keep asking me that? This is so fucked. But that's not what the prosecutor was asking. The interpreter sucked. It got to the point where all of the other students that were showing up in support were like slamming their hands on tables, like getting so frustrated. And another nuance to note that I think is very important is that when you are testifying, especially when a young person is testifying, they when you're vulnerable, you normally hold your hands around your body in sort of like a protective gesture. Or maybe you don't make eye contact. Maybe you're crying and you're trying to keep a straight face and remove all emotion as you're recounting the series of events, right? But the nature of sign language that the children were using, they had to pull their hands and arms away from their body to talk. They had to leave their torsos uncovered, which made them even more vulnerable subconsciously. And to describe the emotions and actions, they can't just verbally say, he lifted my shirt. So like I said, with the rudimentary and whole filled sign language that they were using and that they were taught, they had Mm. to mime it out. So they would even lift up their own shirt in the court to to really show what happened. And another thing that's constantly taught to those that are learning sign language is that facial expressions are part of sign language. Because I think with... um, with speak spoken language you have the tone inflections that kind of indicate the mood or the vibe that you're trying to communicate across with sign language because the hand motions could mean similar things you're using your face to express the emotion that you want the viewer to understand Mm -hmm. i mean even with tone inflections if you have someone who's speaking in monotone it's kind of hard to understand what type of emotion you're supposed to feel so it's very important and to feel to recreate those facial expressions without personally being back in that trauma, I think is impossible. Yeah. So the whole trial, they're reliving the trauma. They're basically ripping their heart bare to the court and everyone was under the belief of, okay, this is really bad, but the kids are doing their part and the adults are going to do our part and we're going to fight for justice. And this worthy sentence will show the world that they can never do this again. It'll be a landmark case, right? The principal was given two years and 10 months. The vice principal, one of the more heinous people involved in all of this, was given eight months. Two nurses were given 10 months each, and most of these were then commuted to probation instead of jail time. How? Yeah, I'm going to get into it. Legal stuff. The judge wasn't even a bad person. The judge straight up kept apologizing to the victims because there was nothing he could legally do. It was shocking. Fuck. It was shocking. The case could be classified as two crimes. Crimes persecutable upon complaint. So in South Korea, SA, especially against minors at the time legally, you couldn't do it until the minors complained or pressed charges. Now, the way that the prosecutors were trying to go about this case is they were trying to get the perpetrators jailed for a very specific law, which is SA against people with disabilities. Mm Mm-hmm. Why is that important? Why didn't they just do SA? Well, because SA is not a felony in South Korea. At least at the time, it wasn't. So most people were getting like probation for SA. For raping people? Yes. But if you did this for a minor with a disability, you would more likely get jail time. This was probably as harsh as the sentence gets. What the fuck? And they couldn't do essay against a minor because the statute of limitations at the time was one year one year so this kid endured the most traumatic thing that a human can ever endure really and they have one year oh, i'm gonna start crying bro what the fuck this whole shit is fucked to show up in court and lay their heart bare and do all these things otherwise your time is up so f- can you imagine having a ticky ticking time clock like over your head yeah because you just ruined a kid's life yeah 
and in return, as long as nothing happens in a year, you're free to go. Yeah. When you just ruin a human being's life forever, mm -hmm. alter their life forever. Now, thankfully, there is no statute of limitations, or at least not um, a one-year one for if they are children with disabilities. Now, here's the disgusting part. The premise of all of this is that people with disabilities, this is where the ableism comes into strong play. The law is written that a person with a disability cannot fight back or say no. That's how they describe a disability. So even if you're able to sign no, even if you're able to shake your head no, oh, no. or scream for help, even if you are disabled and yet you can still speak and say, please stop or scream, somebody help me. I feel like I know where this then is Then you cannot technically be a part of this law. Bro. So let's take Eugene's case. Oh her R worder held her down and assaulted her. She did have a disability that is listed as severe. However, there were witnesses that testified that she multiple times stated, no, no, I don't want this. So she said no. And because physically she could say no, she no longer qualified for the specific clause that she was a child with a disability. Oh now, essay against a child, they couldn't do it because the statute of limitations was up. So they got like nothing. Once the statement was signed to all the people in the court, so the victim's parents, fellow students, and I want to say this with, like, I, I'm trying to phrase this with as much respect and sensitivity as possible, but if you know or have been around a deaf person, being deaf doesn't mean being mute. Exactly. A lot of deaf people still have the capabilities of producing sound. Right. And since they've never heard spoken language, it's next to impossible for them to mimic it because they can't hear the language, right? Mm -hmm. Which means if they're deaf from birth, they typically can't speak a spoken language, but they still make sounds and they can still yell, they can still wail, they can still cry. But again, since they've never heard someone else do it, like this is how humans are created. You know, so much is hearing. Even babies, so much is hearing, right? Because they haven't heard people yell, it's a different sort of sound that comes out when they yell. And I don't know how to describe it, but I think that's how humans were supposed to yell. It's almost like a visceral, like the purest form of a yell that I can describe. Mm -hmm. It's like guttural. It's so raw. And I think you feel the grief and it's just, it's different. Like it stays with you. And that day, the entire courtroom was filled with the grief of the victims. And a reporter wrote, The moment that we heard the verdict, the courtroom was filled with the indescribable sounds from all the people. Mm. After the trial, the school was still opened. And after probation, all the administrators were back running the school. They were back around students because technically they had the right to hire whoever they wanted. There was no legal clause that said, hey, you can't be a teacher or an administrator out of school if you have this in your criminal history. Side note, Mr. J had to flee the country because he was attacked during this whole thing. Yeah, the defense attorney like came out with some crazy allegations against him. I don't huh? even know how that was allowed in court, but... And the public, you know, they were enraged by this verdict, but what can they do? Their lives moved on. So the public, they were mad, but they moved on mm -hmm. until the movie came out. Oh. And this film was a box office hit. It had an audience of 4.7 million viewers, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 10% of South Korea's population. Oh, shit. Wow. Yeah. God damn. Even the president at the time saw the movie. Oof. Another person who watched the movie was the South Korea's National Police Agency Commissioner, General Cho. General Cho got right to work. Okay. He formed a special team to investigate the school, and he was really sneaky with it. I don't even think that the school knew that they were being watched again. They just knew like the movie came out, and they were like, oh, bad press. Oh, bad Meanwhile, press. Meanwhile, netizens were going, growing increasingly upset, and they wrote things like, what? In order to punish a trash criminal, the victim has to make a movie or a novel and make every single person in the country angry? Probably. That's how the justice system works now. Mm -hmm. We all have to get so emotionally invested in every case. The public put so much social pressure on the police department that the Inwa school sexual assault case was officially reopened. And it was it was a lot. Now, there were they couldn't gather the same victims because that's double jeopardy. They can't be tried for the same crimes against the same victims. Like I said, double jeopardy. So they started focusing on different victims. Mm. And the victims now were being represented by a huge human rights attorney, Lee Mong Suk. Okay. If you saw this man walking down the street in Korea, you would think he's just a random ajashi, like middle-aged man. He tackled some of the biggest human rights cases in South Korea. 
when an eight-year-old known to the nation by her alias Nayani was brutally assaulted in a public restroom. Do you remember that case? Uh -huh. To the point where she was left permanently disabled. He represented the eight-year-old. He was the reason that the perpetrator even got any jail time. He really cared about the kids, and this man was smart. Mr. Lee knew that every case needs a villain's face. You know, that's how it is. That's why big corporations are harder to be canceled online than a celebrity, because with a celebrity, you have a face. You can attach these emotions to a face. With corporations, it's a board of directors. It's a board of investors, executives. Every story needs a villain. And he thought the problem was the administration was too big of a villain. So they singled out the vice principal. Hey. That would be the face of their case. Mm, okay. But the problem is he can't be tried again for the exact crimes because of double jeopardy. So Lawyer Lee does something different. He was going to get the children treatment, therapy. First of all, he was the first person to ever care about their futures. <laughs> he wanted them on the path to healing. But not only that, he wanted to do something that was never done before. A landmark case. He was going to sue the perpetrators for inflicting injury. What injury? mental trauma this would be the first time in south korea mm. that someone would sue for mental like emotional distress mm. after a crime mm. okay okay because usually during the court trials people would talk about the physical injuries but they would never really even acknowledge the mental trauma that would exactly. linger for the rest of their lives mm. so now he was solely going to use that okay because there is no statute of limitations for inflicting injuries and he was going to argue this was an injury. Huh. And the statute of limitations would start the day they get diagnosed with the injury. Mm. Okay. So they needed some sort of trauma diagnosis. And he wanted to bring in the best of the best because these kids were living on social welfare. They didn't have funds. His friend was a, psychiatry, a psychiatry professor at Yonsei University. This is like Korea's Johns Hopkins, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And Yonsei is a public institution, and the hospital that they had near this school, because they have hospitals all over the country, it, they were underfunded and understaffed, even though they're one of the biggest institutions. It sounds easy, but this professor had to work with so many people at Yonsei, and they had to move so many schedules around. Everyone worked overtime to get these students in. And as they were waiting, because these students cannot be diagnosed unless they are inpatient, as they're waiting for everything to work out, the doctors and nurses on that floor that would be in contact with these students, they obviously couldn't learn that much, but they learned, hi, thank you, are you hungry, are you sleepy, are you okay, do you need anything? In sign language. Uh -huh. They were able to get volunteer drivers. People in the community stepped up. Um, there's a lot of students. They would need to be driven from hospital to hospital, from lawyer appointment to court dates. People volunteered to drive them around and just get them to these places. People volunteered to drive the parents around to be able to make sure that they're there. And the kids were all sadly diagnosed with some sort of PTSD from the abuse. Mm. The only silver lining of that diagnosis would be that now Lawyer Lee could aggressively go after the abusers. If they won, this would change the country, really. He even told the judge in the courtroom, please take a close look at the victim's eyes, their voice, their facial expressions and body reactions. Even if you don't speak sign language, even if you can't understand the words that the victims are saying, you right. don't need to understand the words to know what kind of pain that they've been through. He would tell the attorneys on his team and the interpreters, don't ask difficult words, abstract words, or long sentences. Don't ask short answered questions like yes or no answers. Ask them questions in an open manner. Mm -hmm. This time, a bunch of very, very capable, competent interpreters volunteered to be a part of this case. They had the Our Sexual job. Violence Counseling Center work on this. They had psychiatrists from Yonsei, psychologists, sign language interpreters, drivers, court, like everyone. Basically, Yonsei University was backing these kids. Everyone volunteered their time and effort and expertise. And it worked. The judge accepted the infliction of injury charge. And the vice principal, the worst of them all, the one that had gotten eight months, mm -hmm. got 12 years in prison. It's still small, but the court back in Korea, um, back in the day and still today, not very inclined to send someone to jail for more than 10 years for a crime, even if it's some of the most heinous. But he still tried to appeal his sentence saying that it was too harsh. Thankfully, it was denied. Thank you. What the fuck? But still... 
The rest got virtually no punishment. Uh. The good news is the school was shut down and the students were sent to other boarding schools. Um, a lot changed, though. But one victim's parents said, essay on a child is like murdering a soul. Oof. The physical or mental wound remains forever. The offender can avoid punishment after a certain period because of the statute of limitations, but for the kid, it's the rest of their lives. But Korea got to work. Civilians started advocating and protesting the change to the essay law. So there is a clause in basically all essay laws at the time that said, did they fight back? They said that shouldn't even be a question, especially with minors and exactly. particularly minors with disabilities. Yeah, what? So that's in the works. And prior to this, if a victim of essay did not formally press charges or sue the perpetrator, the police would do nothing. That has also been changed. Now police are allowed to go after these abusers without the victim being involved, which is a very good thing because that's just re-traumatizing them, right? Mm -hmm. Especially right after. And like the way that some of these trials were going on, it was weird. There was also another law put in place that said that if you are a state-funded institution, like a welfare establishment, you cannot hire only family members. One third of hires have to be outsiders, which I get. It's like a good step in the direction, but not enough. Like imagine going up against two thirds of an institution and they're one big family. Mm -hmm. So things have changed. But I think that this is still something that every South Korean probably feels a lot of pain about. It's definitely a very, it, it was a movie and it was a case that I think changed everyone, just like this Hewer Fairy case, Ugh. just like even Itaewon. I think a lot of areas and a lot of countries have these moments where people just, the civilians get fed up mm -hmm. and they start putting their foot down. And I think this was one of them. That's usually when it, what it Before takes. Before I finish up the episode, let me tell you about the principal's thesis paper that was later uncovered by netizens. What? The principal of Inwa, one of the abusers, wrote a huge thesis paper on how important it is to take care of disabled people. He wrote, In order to help students with disabilities, treatment and rehabilitation has to be given from someone who loves them from the heart. It is the caretaker's job to secure the student's uncertain future without a single ounce of regret. Caretakers should serve in the role of a helping hand in place of the disabled. A helping hand, he said. If that's how he gives a helping hand, I think we should all hope that he gets a handful of care every single day for the rest of his miserable life. And that is it for today's episode. Please stay safe. And I will see you guys on Wednesday for the main episode. Hey, my um, I did not know she did Carly Russell case. Um, I just okay. Just so y'all know that this was requested. I didn't know which one I was gonna do next, and I saw that y'all wanted me to watch this one. I'm not gonna lie, this one fucked me up to the point where it's like the audacity of people is high. Like, higher than rent nowadays. It doesn't make sense to me how somebody can be so evil, so nasty, so arrogant, so disgusting to the point that they will put a thesis telling other people of how you should treat the same people that he abused. I'm, I'm speechless. Like I said before, I come from a family of teachers, so this kind of makes me mad as fuck. Because, like, bro, like that, that, that's that. Nah, nah. There's a special place in hell for everybody who was a part of this operation that did damage to these kids. And I really hope, I hope that when uh, mm, I ain't gonna say it. I'm I'm trying to learn self control. I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. It's a special place in hell for y'all motherfuckers. Y'all gonna get yours. Fucking up these kids' lives like that. It's just like I don't understand, bro. I don't get it, bro. Shout out to Mr. J. I hope he's doing well and his family. But like that vice principal need to get his ass knocked off. I'm not gonna hold you. Somebody do something in jail to that nigga, please. He better he better not serve that full twelve. He better not serve that full twelve. Shit.